Uh, sort of truth, are you here? <clears throat> sort of truth. Are you here? Sorry about that. Already Satan started with the attacks, using Christians to start problems. And then the atheist gets blamed. Sort of truth, are you here? Respond. God bless you, Kevin. You see, Christians cannot control themselves. Yeah. Even before we start the live stream, another controversy, like the flat earth one. Uh, vaccines are bad. You shouldn't tell people to take vaccines, you know. Anyway, I just want to know. Sort of truth, respond or I'm going to block you. Even before we begin an important subject on being born again, right? Yeah, yeah, they started. Yeah, this time sort of truth going after going after Andrew because he thinks that vaccinations <clears throat> are a government conspiracy to destroy people. And it's the cause of autism, whether it's true or not. I don't understand why these topics come up here in my channel. All right. And notice when, right, when we're about to talk about an important subject. So he's not here, sort of truth. He's not responding. Because I'll scroll up and look for his channel. If he does respond, I'm a block. Sorry about that. Yeah, Christian going after Andrew Martin. And it's the same Christians that attack Andrew Martin. Last time he got attacked, Flat Earth, by Zena, and she's complaining that an atheist is taking over. Anyway. Yeah, listen, Luisa, if you vaccin vaccinate or not, that's between you and the Lord Jesus. I don't have a dog in the fight. I could care less whether someone thinks vaccinations are of the devil, a government conspiracy, or they're good. I don't care. that I don't have a dog in this fight. You get what I'm saying? Don't bring it to my channel. Don't bring it to my channel. Don't bring the flat earth to my channel. There are YouTube pages. There are social media groups that talk about that. In fact, even my ex-wife was against vaccines, and she was afraid to vaccine my daughters. I don't have a problem. I don't care. Okay, for the record, you believe a flat earth. You believe a rectangular earth. You believe a square earth. I don't care. I really don't care. You believe vac vaccinations are are harmful. You believe vaccinations are good. Vaccinations came from the pit of hell, that there was a seance and some witches summoned up, you know, evil spirits to give them recipes for vaccinations to destroy kids. I don't care. No, Luisa, it's, you don't need to get defensive. I don't care. You understand my point? You, you with me, right? <sighs> Unbelievable. Man. It's very sad and tragic. It's pathetic. You know, we're, we're talking, we want to talk about something that does matter, being born again. And what do they start talking about? Vaccination. I'm going to give sort of truth a minute to respond. I know he's here unless he got blocked. Did someone block him? Yeah, we're going to start. Yeah. Okay, everyone here? Yeah. Yeah, but it's been over 300 seconds, right? He's not here? Okay. I'm going to repeat this one more time. Okay, I'm going to repeat this one more time. How you doing, Protestant? Good to see you, brother. Good to see you. Thank you, uh, Taylor. I'm going to use that to buy me some submarine sandwiches and ice cream. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for the support because I'm going to buy ice cream and submarine sandwiches. Yeah. And anyway, I just want to repeat again. Okay, I want you to listen to me. Okay, please. I, I don't know, laugh or cry. Okay, listen. Listen to me. I don't care if you believe the earth is flat or round. I don't care if you think vaccinations are from the devil or they're good. Do not bring it here to my, my channel. Don't start debates and fights in my channel. And then the Andrew becomes a scapegoat, a scapegoat because he's the bad guy. He's the atheist. He's taking over. See, that's what they do, right? They make him the scapegoat, the bad guy. He's evil because he's an atheist. Yet, even though he professes to be an atheist, he does more 
to expose Islam and bring people to Jesus Christ. Did you know that? He brings people to my channel to be Christian and hear the gospel. Okay. You know that, right? For no reason. The gentleman just spoke about that in his country, they're giving vaccinations for the coronavirus. And then sort of truth, who is an angel from heaven, who's received revelation from heaven to bring it to mankind. No, that's evil. You shouldn't be talking about it. And they started. And they started a debate over vaccinations. What do you what do you say? Well, I mean, okay. Let me repeat again one thing again. Maybe I wasn't clear. Even my ex-wife didn't vaccinate my kids because she thought it would damage their health, right? And it doesn't help that you have people divided on this issue. You even had what Jenny McCarthy, who would who was a spokesperson against vaccinations because she believed that her son contracted autism from vaccination, and she had Jim Carrey on her side when they were dating, right? There was a documentary on this. Okay, here's my point. If vaccinations are from the devil, if they are from God, don't know, don't care. Don't bring it to my channel. If the earth is flat, don't know, don't know, don't care. I believe it's wrong. Maybe I've been deceived. So what? Okay. So you shared your info about vaccinations being used of the Antichrist to start a one world government? You serious? Sort of truth? Are you that naive? What if you're wrong and you're interpreting the Bible incorrectly and then you shame Jesus Christ by your false understanding of Scripture? What should I do to you now for that? You're not the first person who thought the end was coming. People have thought that in every century. Unbelievable. Christos Anesti, you work in the medical field, just curiously. I just want this, and we're going to begin. Yeah, because your interpretation of the news is inspired by God. So you're interpreting that this army that they're gathering is somehow related to the Bible. So an army, National Guard coming in, that means Antichrist is coming. Stop it, sort of truth. Stop it while you're ahead. Okay, so Christos Anesti, he's a believer who loves Jesus. He's in the medical field. Christos, you are a moron. Because vaccines are the devil. What's wrong with you? It's of the devil, man. You sold out to the one world government. The army's coming. Stupidity, Nasha. I'm going to repeat it a final time. Thank you, Emma. I'm going to repeat it a final time. I do not want conversations about the flat earth on my channel. I do not want conversations about vaccination. There are other YouTube channels, other social groups you can join. Don't bring this here, this nonsense, and let the devil cause distraction. Okay? Sorry about that. I even see, I started at angry. Today's topic is I'm going to start banning most of the Christians, and so that I'll never get to the goal of having 800 viewers for my live session. Okay? Now, with that said, are we going to focus? Are we going to focus? Thank you, Riaz. God bless you. All. Are we going to focus before I start? I'm already upset. You guys start me angry. May the Lord Jesus give me the grace not to be angry and fill me with peace and joy because I was excited to teach this subject with every one of you. All right? And then they, they attack the atheist here. Poor guy, because he's an atheist. Yeah, the atheist has taken over. No, Zena, let your brothers take over. Yeah, okay. We love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you, and Holy Spirit, we love you, though we love you imperfectly, and we love each other imperfectly, and sometimes we do great harm, damage, and we disgrace the name of Christ. Forgive us, Father. Lord Jesus, forgive us. Holy Spirit, forgive us. And Lord, please destroy my unrighteous anger, my, my unholy indignation. Rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Fill us with the fruit of your spirit. Fill us with life from your spirit. Fill us with power from your spirit. Fill us with the joy and peace and the calmness and the stillness that comes from your Holy Spirit. Fill us with joy from your Holy Spirit, Father. Transform us to conform to the image of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Purify us in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. Cleanse us in the blood of Jesus. And I pray that for our loved ones. 
whether our parents or grandparents or siblings or spouses or children, grandchildren, bless them and wash them and cleanse them and purify them in the blood of Jesus, that the blood of Jesus will be their shield. In my case, my daughters, and shield their mother as well, Father. Lord Jesus, shield them. Shield all of us and our loved ones. Holy Spirit, shield us and seal us for the glory of Jesus Christ. Take over this session. Anoint my words to speak truth without error. Save me from stammering and confusion to do justice to this topic. And bless everyone to understand. Open their eyes and their hearts and their ears to understand what the Bible says. And guide me to recall the scriptures, interpret them correctly. Save me from error, Father. Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, and purify our hearts. Purify my motives. Please, Lord, not to do it for fame, for fortune, but for your glory. And destroy all attacks of the evil one. Save us from distractions from the evil one. And give us the power of the Holy Spirit to focus, be attentive, and open up the eyes of our minds and our hearts to understand and absorb this information for the glory of Jesus. We need you, Father, not just to know the Bible, but to live it in the power of the Holy Spirit and to love your word. We need you, Lord Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit. Bless the session. Bring them, Lord. Bring many more to hear this for your glory. And bless the internet connection, Lord. And bless the sound of my voice to be pleasing to their ears. And fill us with the breath of life. Fill my lungs and chest and throat with the breath of life to do this for your glory. And not to panic. You're almighty over the coronavirus and all vaccinations, Lord. We trust in you. And we love you and we depend on you. Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name. Yeah, I'm Father, Son, and Spirit. Okay, Father, Son, and Spirit. I should get me some water. Obviously a very important subject. You obvious, and uh, when I say obvious, it's obvious. It's not going to be one part because I have a lot of unpacking. I have a lot of explaining, and I'm trusting the Spirit to guide me to do it with great accuracy and save me from error for the glory of Jesus Christ, right? And make sure you listen and re-listen and re-listen. -re -re and one thing you do, always pray, always pray that the Holy Spirit will guide not just you but me, all of us, to all truth, protect you from all error, and to show me where I'm mistaken, and enable me to correct those mistakes and not repeat them. Be humble enough, teachable enough to change my position when I'm shown I'm wrong. Because the Holy Spirit is the perfect teacher, the perfect guide. He'll guide you all truth. Every mistake, every error, every, every sin is from us. Everything perfect and good is from the chime God, from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So our, our God, the Godhead, gets the glory. And I pray again that the Holy Spirit will loosen my tongue, save me from stammering in Jesus' name. Now, with that said... Thank you, Andrew Martin. Lord bless you, man. Watch over you, and the Lord Jesus will bring you to his feet. Before the Lord returns and before, or if he tarries, and before you leave this earth, I have confidence you will cry out to Jesus again because there's too much in you for you to reject Jesus. So pray for him. Pray for that young Muslim young man that came today. It was an amazing encounter, right? Let me get some water. Hold on. Right. Sorry, man, my, my legs. My leg, man. What's up, man? What would be like? I want you to see something. Look at me. Look at me, see? Look at that, look at that. Hold on, let me see. Let me come, come, come closer. Look at this. Look at that, look at that. I'm losing weight, baby. I got 50 more to go. It's going to go. Come on, come on. Right? And you know what my shirt says, right? Sarcasm. Just one of my, um, my many talents, sorry. Hopefully the next connection stays strong. All right, let's go to John chapter 3. Let's read verses 3 to 8. John chapter 3, verses 3 to 8. I used to be able to do push-ups, but when I got the flu a couple months ago, I stopped, but I got to get back because my shoulders are getting narrow and my hips are getting wider because I'm losing weight. Usually the last area to go completely is your midsection, your hips. So I got to start doing some resistance exercises to build up the mass. Before, I used to have a V-taper. You know how you have a V-taper? You know? I used to have a V-taper. Now I have an upside-down V. So I have a V-taper, but it's upside-down. So if I do a handstand, you'll see my V-taper. Stop it, you haters. You know, and praise the Lord for the mods who helped me to help you. All right. John chapter 3, verses 3 to 5. Protestant has been able to join us. He was working today. God bless him. Right? John chapter 3, verses 3 to 5. Okay. 
Let's begin. Amen, Sophia, he will. Just be patient with him. Leave him be. He's helping us expose Islam, and he's bringing people to Christ. What else do you want an atheist to do? Anything more than that? Okay. Is the mods here, or did they take a vacation? Mods, did you take a break, or you guys got left behind? They go, so I can start reading. I'll start reading. If you, I don't know. I thought they were here. So what's going to happen first last? You're going to be the last to post? Okay, John 3, verses 3 to 8. Okay, read with me, folks. Read with me. John chapter 3, verses 3 to 8. Thank you, first last. I don't know what happened. You took a nap on me or something? Or you're looking at your abs in the mirror and admiring yourself. You're the only one that does. At least you have someone who admires you. John chapter 3, verses 3 to 8. Let's focus. Now read. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now the word for again, anothen. Anothen can also mean from above. It can also mean anew. So the word born again, the Greek word anothen, can mean <clears throat> anew, born anew. That's why it's again, or born from above. But <clears throat> both meanings are implied. You need to be born again by being born from above, meaning born from the spirit who comes from above. Now, we'll get there. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I'll explain, God willing, not now, God willing in a future session, what it means to be born of water and spirit. Do not pontificate and chime in until I discuss that issue. Don't tell me what you think it means. Let's wait till we get to that session, and I'll give you all the interpretations that have been offered, and then we'll see which interpretation best fits the context. Trusting the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth for the glory of Jesus Christ. But I want you to see verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto, you, unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth, the wind bloweth, where it listeth, wherever it goes, wherever it, its path Happens to be guided by God, obviously. And now here's the sound thereof, but can't not tell. You don't know whence, it's, whence it cometh, when it's coming and where it's going. And where did it come from? Where did wind come from? Where is it going? You don't know that. Right? And whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. What Jesus is saying in verse 8, let me break that down. You will not understand and you cannot perceive how the Holy Spirit causes someone to be born again. This is a miraculous work of God that you don't understand and cannot perceive. You don't perceive and see how it's done, but you see the results of it, the fruit of being born again. Do you understand what our Lord is saying? As the Spirit anoints me for the glory of Jesus, to bless you to understand. Do you understand what, he, what our Lord is saying here? Okay. The work of the Holy Spirit is a miraculous work of God. If you don't like it, tough guy, you can come and do something about it, but you know you won't because you know I'll smash you and muzzle you. Glory to God. Anyway, the, the work, listen, the work of the Holy Spirit is a miraculous work. We don't know the mechanics of it, how we become transformed, how we are born anew, born from above, but we know that's what God does, and we see the results of it. You with me there? Are you with me, Ariel? Don't worry, Ariel. This is just the beginning. When I get people who are dogs who start foaming with their blasphemy, man, I just turn to them and muzzle them because I'm known as one of the greatest dog catchers who ever lived, and I got a muzzle for them. Anyway, but focus. Just focus now. Don't let Satan distract because, guys, Satan's going to distract a lot, a lot. So I'm warning you. We plead the blood of Jesus Christ to cover us. Focus. All right. But I want you to see John 3, verse 6 again, why you must be born again. The Lord basically tells you in a very succinct statement why you need to be born again. In John 3, verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Guys, pay attention. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So here, basically, succinctly, he tells you flesh can only produce flesh. Flesh can only beget flesh. Flesh comes out of flesh. And you came out of flesh. Flesh begot you, produced you, and now you need to be born of the Spirit. You need to be made alive by the Spirit. You need to come forth from the Spirit. Right there, the Lord gives it away. 
right there, the Lord gives it away. There's something about flesh that is not good enough and incapable of dwelling in God's heavenly kingdom. You understand? There's something about the flesh, being born of flesh, that makes, makes it in, impossible for us to dwell in the kingdom of God. Makes it impossible for us that we are incapable to dwell in God's presence. So right there, he gives it away. And I'll expound on it and unpack it. But you got to walk with me and pay attention and ask the Lord to save you from distractions. Okay? And try not to pontificate or chime in too much. Listen more than you speak because I want you to get it. The Lord is not the only one who says you need to be born anew, born again, born from above. This is the teaching of the New Testament. Some writers use the same language, similar language. Some writers use different language to say the same thing. Let me repeat that again. Some writers use similar language, same language, right? And some writers use different language to convey the same truth. Different language, different words that are synonymous, right? So it's not only our Lord. Let's go and see James chapter 1, verse 18. James 1, verse 18. Watch here. Of his own will, he begot us. Of his own will, begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. God's own will. It was God's pleasure, his will, his desire. No one forced him. No one compelled him. No one made him to do that. God's own free will out of his love gave birth to us through the word of truth. What does it mean? The word of truth was used to transform us and make us spiritually anew. Through the preaching of the word, the spirit produced life in us, in faith in our hearts, because the preaching of the word is used by the spirit to make you alive, born anew. Are you seeing it? Begat he us. Now, if you don't mind, first last use, maybe ESV, just to see, so you can see the point a little more clearly in modern English. James 1.18. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth. Now, again, that doesn't do justice because when you say brought us forth, you don't know what he means by that. It means gave us birth. A woman brings forth a child. My mother brought forth a child. My wife brought forth a child. See, NIV, which is not my favorite translation, captured it. You see the NIV? He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. You see it? So here's another inspired writer that says, Believers who are truly believers were born again, brought forth, were given birth by God. God birthed them spiritually. Right? 1 Peter 1 verse 3. 1 Peter 1 verse 3. So it's not just John 3. People think it's only in John 3 where being born from above, born anew, born again, born of God, born of the Spirit. Nope. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. New birth. Do you catch it? Yeah. Father, Son, Spirit, destroy the distractions of the evil one. I told you. Sorry, we're going to buffer here and there. But he gave us new birth into a living hope. Right? So again, here's another reference to a new birth. He made us alive unto a living hope, meaning now we have a hope. What's the hope? We will be resurrected and glorified and made immortal with Jesus Christ our Lord. And Jesus' resurrection is the surety, the certainty of our everlasting life. By raising Jesus from the dead, making him immortal, that is the guarantee. That's our destiny. So we have a hope, a hope that keeps us going, a hope that's anchored in Christ being raised giving us absolute certainty, death is not the end of us, but we will live forever. Right? It means nothing, John. John, what does it mean if I block you for asking me a question that has nothing to do with a topic? What would that mean to you? Okay. 1 Peter 1, 23. 1 Peter 1, 23. Being born again, there it goes. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, 
but of incorruptible by the word of God. Sorry, guys, you're going to have to be patient. Don't panic. It's going to buffer. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. You were born again by the seed that God planted in you. So here, notice the spiritual imagery being used. Spiritual imagery, imagery being used. Okay? God plants his seed, but it's not physical seed. It's spiritual seed. And when he plants the seed, be patient. I told you we're going to get attacked. And the seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. You get it now? The seed is the word of God. It's not physical seed. It's spiritual seed. And it's the word of God. So God takes his word, plants it in you. And then a life is conceived, spiritual life. And a spiritual baby is born. That's why the Bible describes your walk as a baby. You're a baby, a baby, right? Who, as you pray more, fellowship more, worship God more, love Jesus more, study and understand the word more, grow, and you become spiritually mature. Are you with me there? Do you understand what you, the implication is here? And I'm going to prove that to you. I'm going to prove it to you. Read 1 Peter 1, 23 to 25 again, right? <clears throat> yeah. And see what happens. Because you're going to see what he says in the next chapter. In the next chapter, notice what he's going to say. Okay, hold on. Let me know if I'm buffering. Hold on one second. Oh, man. My goodness. Eesh. My goodness. Everything good? Hold on. Sorry, guys. Distractions after distractions of the evil one. Okay. Now. All right, good. 1 Peter 1, 23, 25. Watch. Watch, guys, pay attention. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. Your glory is nothing. It fades because you die. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospels preached unto you. So notice, if you're just flesh, you're like the grass and the flower. Here today, gone to tomorrow. But if the word of God is planted in you, the word of God is imperishable. That makes you imperishable. Did you catch it? So apart from the word of God, you are flesh. And because you're flesh, you're like the flowers and the grass. You will fade away. You will wither. You'll disappear. Not if you have the word of God. If the word of God is planted in you, then you will live forever because the word of God is imperishable. It cannot wither away if it's in you. But now, here's what's interesting. There are no chapter divisions in the oldest Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. If you had a copy of Peter in Greek that comes within the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century, you'll see there are no chapter divisions. In fact, up until the middle, medieval period. And all the letters are capital, no spaces. So although chapter 1 for you ended at verse 25, in a copy of Peter in Greek before chapter divisions and versification were added, there is no chapter. Why is that important? Because let's continue reading to 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. I'm sorry, 1 Peter, not 1 John. Sorry, ignore, ignore what I said. 1 Peter 2, verses 1 to 3. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes, bam, there you go. Do you see what I just said? The Bible describes your new birth as a life being formed in the, in the womb and a baby coming out. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies, and envies and evil speakings as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. So what's your milk, babies? The word of God. See right there. Is the Bible not amazing? Look how miraculously in-depth and beautiful it is. It's deep. Right? So right there. That you may grow thereby 
If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Did you catch it? Do, who's not catching it? I'm hoping the newbies like Louisa, they're, they're everyone's catching it. Do you see? God's seed is planted to you. That's the gospel, the word of God. Okay? Once it's planted, it takes root. A spiritual life is now being conceived and fashioned and formed. And a spiritual baby is the result. Now that you are, the, if I have to answer what the word of God is, I'm going to start blocking people. Christian, why I think I'm going to block you? The word of God is the gospel. He just told you that. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. It's the Quran, Christian Wa. Christian Wa, the word of God is the Quran. Let me recite the chapters of the Quran. Okay. Let's try this again. 1 Peter 1, 23 to 25. Let's see what the word of God is. Okay. But you guys got it, right? In 1 Peter 2, verses 1 to 3. The word of God planted in you, right? And then a life is starting to be formed, fashion, and a baby comes out, and you're that spiritual baby. Which part of the gospel preached unto you wasn't clear, Christian Wa? Were you paying attention? Or are you insulting me by not paying attention? Do you see that in verse 25? I like how Punisher Lee likes to chime in because he just wants to show people, look, see, I understand. I wonder how long he's going to be here. You see that? And this is the word which by the gospels preached unto you. Why would you guys ask me what the word is when Peter just told you? This is the problem I'm having. You guys got to pay attention for your sake, not mine. I want you to learn. Pay attention for the glory of Jesus. Amen? And they wonder why I mean. And tough. So Christian, well, ask me again what, what the word of truth is. Ask me one more time. Okay, so everyone got it? So you understand? You are now spiritual babes if you're born again, and now you need to grow. You would need to grow from a babe to Christian maturity. You go from a babe, but you need to attain manhood or maidenhood you need to become a man or a woman mature in christ are you with me here but how do you grow he told you you start with milk and then as you grow you go deeper and then you have steak and then you have a four five course meal that's why i tell people sometimes this session or this youtube change may not be for you it may be Beyond your ability to comprehend right now. And I can't give you comprehension. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. I cannot give you comprehension. The Holy Spirit takes babies and matures them. And makes them into <clears throat> mature men or women in Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And the difference about spiritual growth. It's not like physical growth. Let me explain what I mean. F Generally, normally, unless there's some physical defect or birth defect, human beings grow at the same pace. You become an infant, then, you know, one, two, three. Okay. In spiritual growth, some people grow leaps and bounds ahead of others. So I start as a babe, but within a year, I'm already mature because the Holy Spirit is the one who causes you to grow according to his timetable and schedule. Are you with me there? So you have someone in the faith for a year, and he's leaps and bounds ahead of someone who's been in the faith for 10 years. Isn't that the case? Some of you have been in the faith, let's say, for 20 years. And you still don't have depth of understanding Scripture. And then here comes a guy, two years, three years, and bam! His understanding of the Bible is amazing. Right? Because... Your growth is the work of the Holy Spirit. And here's another mystery. The more you yield to the Spirit and the more you resist the flesh, the faster you will grow. Let me give you a mystery. The more you yield to the Spirit and the more you mortify the flesh, 
the faster your growth. Right? The more you spend praying, meditating on the word, worshiping, fellowshipping, evangelizing, the faster your growth. The less time you do that, the more time you spend in the world, the less time you spend praying, fasting, reading, listening, evangelizing, the slower your growth. And you know that for yourselves. Without mentioning names, without mentioning names, without you telling me, because I don't know who, when I say mention names, I'm not going to mention them. You know that because if you examine yourselves, some of you are wondering why you haven't grown. But if you look back at your life, how much time did you put in wanting to grow in contrast to the time you spent in other endeavors? Please don't what, Lisa? I don't know what you mean. What are you talking about, Liza? Calm down, Liza. I know you miss me, sister. Lord bless you. Mother, please don't. You with me there? And I'm not mentioning names because I don't know. I'm saying you know. You know yourselves. You know others. Okay? People, you with me there? Good. Thank you, Liza. Bless my heart that you miss me. People wonder why they didn't grow. Well, here's what I want you to answer for yourself. For yourself. For yourself and not publicly because that's between you and the Lord. For yourself. Examine, let's say if you've been in the faith for 10 years, be honest with yourself and say, how much time did I pursue the Holy Spirit through prayer, fasting, studying the Bible, and how much time I spent in other endeavors? You want me there? Let me give myself as an example. Okay. When the Lord put a fire in my heart for the gospel, I didn't want to do anything but learn my faith. I didn't want to do anything but learn my faith. Even when I was working secular jobs, I worked jobs in which I could sit and read the Bible and listen to debates or lectures. I had a hunger from the day the Lord captured my heart to want to know him and his word. And that's the Holy Spirit putting that fire in my heart. You get my point? But that's not because I'm more special than you. I am not. Worldly speaking, let me repeat it again so God gets the glory. Worldly speaking, no high school diploma. I only got a GED. Never been to college, never been to university, never been to seminary. What does that tell you what the Holy Spirit can do through you because he's almighty if you seek him and yield to him? Are you with me there? If someone like me, who from a worldly perspective is a moron, no education, GED, if the Holy Spirit can then take me to this point with this wisdom for the glory of Jesus, what do you think he's going to do in you and through you if you yield? Holy Spirit, teach me this word. I want to know this word. I want to know this Jesus. You're the teacher. I yield to you. Guide me. My life is yours. Please. You get my point? Let me, let me, I got to connect. Hold on, because my, the battery's dying. So part of the reason why people don't grow as fast is because they don't, they don't prioritize. They don't pursue with a fire and a passion, knowing the word of God in order to know Jesus. Right? They'll go to church Sunday. They'll pray here. They'll read daily bread, their daily bread, you know, that a chapter here and there. And then that's it. That's all. That's it. The Bible also likens your spiritual growth to spiritual training, spiritual exercise, spiritual discipline. The more time you spend in the gym, the bigger your muscles, the leaner you get, the healthier you become. The less time you spend in the gym, you won't get the results of the person who's working out eight hours a day, right? The person who's working out eight hours a day is going to blow you away who only works out three times a week, an hour each time. You want me there? 
Don't worry, Christian. Well, I'm not going to block you, brother. I just did that to wake you up and shake you out of your compla complacency, Christian. Well, so you can focus. Now you know to focus. Right now, you know to focus. See, now I scared you, right, Christian? Well, I got your attention. Now you're going to be OK. Now you're going to focus. Yeah, baby. All right. OK. See, it worked. OK, now with that said, do you see it's not just John chapter three. It's not just Jesus who says you must be born again. James says it. You are born anew, brought forth. Peter says it. Even John, who quotes Jesus, says it. Let's go to John 1, 12 to 13. John 1, 12 to 13. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Born of God. Born of God. Let's go to 1 John 2, 29. 1 John 2.29, born of God. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteous is born of him. See, when you do what is righteous and you try to obey him, that is the fruit, the result of you being born of him, of God, of the spirit. 1 John 5 verse 11, I'm sorry, 1 John 5 verse 1. 1 John 5 verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Whosoever is believing, believes and trusts and keeps believing and trusting that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone that loveth him, everyone who loves Jesus, everyone who loves the Father that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Now give us a plainer translation. So if you love your brother and sister who's born of God, you love God. If you love a brother and sister who's been born of God, that means you, you love the one who birthed them. In other words, if I don't love you, how can I love the one who birthed you? If I don't love the child, I can't love the parent. Because to love the child is to honor the parent who gave birth to him. That's what John is saying here. Everyone who believes that Jesus Christ has been born of God, everyone who loves the Father loves wh whoever has been born of him. Did you catch it? So the Bible is saying there is no way you can love the Father and not the child. Because to love the Father is to love his children. To love his children is to honor the parent who begot them. So don't tell, you, tell me, tell yourself... I love Jesus, but I can't stand my brothers and sisters. And God says, no, you don't. You don't love me. You love me. You got to love my children. To love my children is to love me. Because if you lo love the one who's born, then you love the one who gave them birth. And if you love the one who gave them birth, then you're going to love the ones that he gave birth to spiritually. Spiritually. Right? Is it making sense? Right? Yes, exactly, Punisher. Why would you preach to the world if you don't love them and want to see them get saved because Jesus loves them? Unless you're just preaching for the sake of doing your duty as if you're doing God a favor. If that's your motive, then your motive is corrupt. Your motive is corrupt. The reason why I preach the gospel to the world is because they're dying and perishing and Jesus loves them and aches for them and wants to reconcile them to himself. So I have to be broken for those that Jesus is broken for. And I have to do it out of love for them because Jesus loves them, not as a duty. Okay, God, I'll preach because I got to do it. I'm doing you a service. It's a duty. That's the wrong motive, wrong motivation. Right? It's a wrong motivation. Now, we got that part. We got the first part out of the way, right? The Bible's repeated teaching. The Bible's repeated teaching. Born again. Born of God. Born anew, born above, right? Right? It's clear. It's not just John chapter 3. Many people think it's only in John 3, right? In fact, prior to this session, how many of you thought this teaching of being born anew, born above, born again, was only in John chapter 3? Put a one. That it's only in John chapter 3. 
No, it's all over. It's all over. Good. Many of you knew it already. In fact, Paul says the same thing, but uses different language. Remember I said there are different ways to express the same truth? Different ways to express the same truth? Paul also emphasized the need of being born again, but he doesn't use that language. He uses something else, a new creation, being spiritually circumcised, being circumcised with Christ, a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 is one. Okay? 2 Corinthians 5.17, that's one. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. That's being born again. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, in a nutshell, let me explain to you why the new birth. Here is why, in a nutshell, that I'm going to give you the verses to prove it. According to the scriptures, according to the Bible, when God created the cosmos, the heavens and the earth, everything in it, everything was good. Everything was very good. Everything was created perfectly for the purpose in which God made it. There were no flaws or defects. And where am I getting this from? Let's go to Genesis 1, verse 31. Genesis 1, verse 31. Now follow with me. I'm going to have to tread lightly and try to explain it so I don't confuse anyone. Genesis 1, verse 31. I left my phone over there. And God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. According to the Bible, when God created the heavens and the earth, and he created sentient beings, meaning life with intelligence, with minds and volition and will, they were all created initially good, very good. But he created them with a potentiality. Are you listening here? He created them with a potentiality. He gave them an ability, a potential to do what? To disobey him and corrupt his design. Disobey him and corrupt themselves and corrupt their natures. Right? Let me give you a very bad analogy, a very bad one, because there's, there's nothing that I can compare it to. Right? But I'll give you a bad analogy. Imagine, and again, I don't mean to demean human beings. But imagine a car coming out of the manufacturer. Flawless, perfect, but its very design through wear and tear and misuse can break down <clears throat> and can wear out. So imagine you've been designed like that car. You came out of the manufacturer flawless, but you were designed in such a way that through use and abuse and misuse, you can break down, wear out, and tear apart. Not just physically, but psychologically and spiritually. You get the analogy now? Not just physically, but emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. This is the teaching of the Bible. That God, when he created the spirit realm and human beings, he didn't create robotons. He didn't create robots or, or, or puppets. He created sentient beings who had mind, volition, and will. And created him such a way to have the ability to want to submit to him or rebel against him. And in rebelling against him, corrupting themselves and their design, polluting themselves and tainting themselves, not just physically, but psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. Is that clear? Before I move on? Is that clear? Before I move on? So did God make us sinful, weak, corrupt, tainted? Absolutely not. Then who did? Sentient beings, meaning beings with intelligence, beings created with the ability to make a choice, corrupted themselves. And here's the proof. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 29. Now we're going to sp spend some time unpacking the meat of Genesis. Are you ready? There's going to be at least two sessions. At least two sessions, if not three, God willing. Are you ready? Ecclesiastes 7.29. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright. How did God make man? Righteous and upright. But they have sought out many inventions. Man devised things to do and 
and followed ways that corrupted themselves. Not God. Did you read right there? Please ask you 729. Read one more time. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. They have found ways to corrupt themselves, ways to pollute themselves, ways to taint themselves. Who's not getting this? I hope the newbies are listening. How about on Discord? Are they getting it? Daughter of Christ, everyone else? Are they getting it? Let me get my phone. Hold on. Hold on, guys. Hold on. Everyone got it? This guy. Oh, Kelly Klein. Kelly Klein. You keep imitating me where buying my shirts. What a sinner. Okay. Okay. Now. Let me show you, because here I want to bless our sisters in the Lord. Sisters, I'm going to show you the value, the dignity you have in the light of the triune God. Are you ready? The, the value and the dignity you have in the light of the triune God. I don't know why my camera's not working. Man. Anyway, you ready? Okay. Let's go to Genesis 1, 26. Here we're going to go into the meat. We're now going into the meat. Someone's going to have to help me. How do I get more light on my phone? Anyway, I'll worry about it later. Okay. Genesis 1, 26. And God said, let us make man. Here, Luis and everyone else. The Hebrew word for man is Adam. And God said, let us make Adam in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Okay, point number one. God creates Adam and gives him dominion over creation. All creation especially the physical creation, is subjected to Adam. Adam is authorized by God to rule over God's creation. Okay, but you didn't catch it, guys. You didn't pay attention. The word man here is Adam in Hebrew. Did you catch it? Adam is more than one. The Adam that God created in Genesis 1 is more than one. Who, who caught it? Let's post it again and see. Let's post it again and see. One more time. God said, let us make Adam, man, in our image, after our likeness, and let them, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Did you guys catch it? The one Adam, Adam, the one Adam, Punisher, I'm itching to block you. I think I'm going to do that. I think I'm going to do that. It's not just the single man's name. It's the name of the woman, but you're not patient. Yeah, I think you're one of those guys that need to be heard and, and get people to give you attention. I don't think you're going to last here, brother. I don't think this channel is for you. Genesis 126. Okay. The one Adam, did you catch it, is more than one person. Let them. Now, let me show you who the them are in verse 27. In verse 27. Let me show you who the them are in verse 27. Not 26, 27. Don't do a Protestant on me. So God created Adam. The word is Adam in Hebrew. Man, Adam, in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Adam is them, male and female together. Did you catch it? I don't think you're, you're catching it. Ladies, Luis, everyone else, are you catching this? You understand the implication of this teaching? The female, like the male, is Adam. You are just as much Adam as the male is. 
because Hebrew word Adam does mean mankind, humanity. This in itself shows that the female is just as much human as the male is, has the same value, dignity, honor, and self-worth that the male does because male and female together are Adam. Not here, Louisa. You're still not getting it. Adam does refer to humanity, but not in Genesis 1, 26, 27. In Genesis 1, 26, 27, who is the Adam there, Louisa? You read it. Who is the Adam? Look at it again, Genesis 1, 27. So God created Adam, man, in his own image. And the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So it does refer to humanity, but initially, Louisa, in Genesis 1, it's the male and female, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve together are Adam. Why? Because the female is just as much Adam as the male. The female is just as much human as the male. So right here from the first chapter, God is dignifying women. Don't let any skeptic, unbeliever, Tell you that the Bible degrades woman. That is a lie from the pit of hell. From the first chapter, God dignifies women by calling woman Adam and saying that the woman with the man has the right to rule creation. Let them, male and female, Adam and Eve, rule my creation. Not just the male, but the female as well. Did you catch it? Are you catching it or no? Who's not catching this? Folks, the woman, the first woman was given three names. Na her name was Adam. Her name was Isha woman. And her name was Chava, Chava, Eve. She was given three names. Pay attention. Three names. Adam, woman, Isha in Hebrew, and Eve, Chava, 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 Chava. Three names. Her initial name was given to, to her by God. She was called Adam. The other two names were given to her by Adam, her husband, the male. But when God created the male and female, he named the female like the male Adam. That was God's name for her. You are Adam like he is Adam, and together you are Adam. You are Adam, he's Adam, and together you are Adam. The other two names was given to her by the man. Let me show you. Go to Genesis 5, verses 1 or 2. Genesis 5, verses 1 or 2. Uh oh, here goes my phone again. Please, Lord, I hope not. Yeah. Genesis 5, verses 1 or 2. This is the book of the generations of Adam. And the day that God created man, Hebrews Adam, in the likeness of God made he him, singular, male and female created he them and blessed them. And called their name Adam in the day when they were created. There you go, folks. Are you, is everyone, is this, you catching this? Second point. Exactly, Mickey Frada. Second point. There's only one place in which God saw there was something not good. There is only one time in the creation account God saw there was something that wasn't good when the male was alone. Go to Genesis 2.18. That's the only time God looked at creation and says, this is not good. The male being by himself is not good. The woman completes him. Genesis 2.18. And the Lord Jehovah God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. It is not good for the male to be by himself. I'm going to create a woman, a female, to complete him and assist him and be his helpmeet. Right? Catching it now? And so when did God say creation was very good? When did he look at creation and say it was very good? When he finished creating the woman and brought her to man. After they came together, that's when God said, very good. You see, woman, look at the honor that God has given you. It wasn't until after the female was created and came together with the male that God then looked at creation and said, very good and rested. Did you know that? Because the last 
act of creation. The last act of creation was the creation of the female. That's the last thing God created. That's the last thing God created was the female. After he finished creating her, he looked at creation and said, very good. Do you see the honor and the dignity God is giving you women in the Bible? Don't let people lie to you and say the Bible denigrates you. He says the man by himself, not good. So I'm going to create a helper equal to him. He creates the female. And when the female is created, brought to the, to the male, that's when God sees creation and says, very good. Everyone getting this? Everyone got it? All right. Now let's read Genesis 2, 19 to 24. Genesis 2, 19 to 24. Because I got to unpack this slowly. So that means unless God has given, given you the gift of celibacy, because God has called some people to a celibate lifestyle, devote themselves entirely. Men, ask Jesus, seek the face of Jesus. Lord, where is that woman to complete me? But make sure she's a woman on fire for Jesus, sold out for Christ. Don't make the mistake of marrying just anyone or you're going to go through hell like I did. Genesis 2, 19 to 23. Read with me. Start reading. And out of the ground, the Lord Jehovah God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living soul, every living creature, that was the name thereof. Now watch this, verse 20. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. Notice, there was no compatible partner from the animal kingdom for Adam. None of the animals were compatible, suitable for Adam. That's what I just said. So then what did God do? He created a partner from Adam's own physical body. Watch. And Jehovah, the Lord God, caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God, Jehovah God, Yahovah God, had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Now watch this. Here's where it's going to get good. When Adam sees her, Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. And shall cleave unto his wife. And they shall be one flesh. Now let me break this down. Let me break this down. Okay. Adam looked at the animals. And found no one suitable for him. So what God did. I know the suitable person for you. He cuts open his side. The word rib. If you go back and look at the lexicon, the word for it means side. He cut the side of Adam, took bone and flesh from him, and fashioned the woman. So then when Adam saw her, he goes, this one is from my bones. This one is made from my flesh. That's why she'll be called woman. I've said it in previous sessions. I'll say it again. The word woman is from the English words womb of man. She's called woman because she's from the womb of man. Now, in Hebrew, if you read it Hebrew, he says, she is Isha because she came from Ish. She, I'm going to call her Isha, feminine form of Ish, because she came from Ish, man. She is Isha. Do you know why? Because that signifies she is of my nature. If she's come out of me, then she has the same nature I do, the same value I do, the same dignity I do. The same self-worth I possess because she's made from me, from my substance. So then how can she be inferior to man? How can she be less than man? How can man be superior in essence, nature, and value when you're just told she's from man. She'll be called woman from the womb of man. She's called Isha because she's from me, Ish. She's from my bones and from my flesh. Greater active. If I have to answer that question, we're going to have trouble. All the animals were created before Eve and Adam, even Adam. All animals were created before Adam and Eve. Genesis 1, the animals were created, then Adam, then Eve. 
pins and needles, needles and pins. We're not told, and it's not important. If she didn't take, if he didn't breathe into her the breath, that means the breath that Adam possesses was transferred to her. Exactly. Now everyone got it? Everyone understand? So do you see in the, two, in the first two chapters of Genesis, God, and this book was written 1,500 years before the birth of Christ. This book was written 1,500 years before the birth of Christ. 3,500 years ago, Moses wrote this, an ancient book showing the value and dignity that women have. Women, because they're from, the first one's from man. She too is Adam. She's of the same essence and nature of Adam. She possesses equal value, dignity, and self-worth that Adam possesses, the first male. You got it? Note again that when Adam was by himself, the male was by himself, God said, that's not good. I'm going to create a helper from his own essence, from his own substance, from himself. She will complete him. Now it's very good. Let me repeat this again. God only said creation was very good when he finished creating Eve, the last act of creation. Eve was the last thing he created. Okay, before I move on, everyone getting this? Everyone getting this? Exactly. The two become one flesh. Because they are from the same flesh, Luisa. So when they come together, they're simply uniting the flesh that they share in common. Because Eve's flesh is from Adam's flesh. So when they come together, it's simply a reunification of that flesh. And from that reunification, another flesh is produced. Now you understand flesh gives birth to flesh. Now, let me add a further question. Let me add a further detail or, yeah, not question, further detail. The Hebrew word for rib, and I can give you the lexicon, I will in a minute. The Hebrew word for rib means side. Folks, understand. It says that God created Eve, Eve from the side, the curve of Adam. Notice he didn't create Eve from the crown of his head. And he didn't create Eve from his foot. Why? So she wouldn't be over him and she wouldn't be beneath him. He created her from his side so she can be joined to his hip alongside of him. Radar, put this guy on timeout. No, they were actually, they were transgender, the animals. Put put him on timeout, radio. Yeah, they were transgender. The animals were transgender, radio. Praise the Lord. Okay. Yeah, the animals were transgender. Okay, coming back to the issue. Let, let's, I know, I know Pedro, bra. <laughs> okay, coming back to the issue. Okay, follow with me. Sorry. Okay, listen, because this guy, the question, you see? All right. Let's let's come back to the issue. The Hebrew word for rib, the Hebrew word for rib means side or curve. God created Eve from the side of Adam, not from the top of his head, not from the from his feet, so that the woman wouldn't be over Adam or beneath Adam, but from the side, so she could be joined to the hip and come alongside Adam. See, now, first slide just gave you the lexicon, the link to the lexicon that tells you it means side. Do you see how much meat there is in this Bible and in this ancient document that was written 3,500 years ago? And do you see the dignity and the value and the honor that God gives women? That God gives women. By the way, for those in Discord, are you seeing the two sisters, brothers and sisters? Okay, everyone got it? But now let me blow you a little further. Let me blow you a little further, blow you away a little further, a little more. Let's go back to Genesis 1, 26. Genesis 1, 26. Let's go back there. Exactly, Jonathan Simon. Okay, I want you to catch the language of God. Guys, pay attention. Here's, you're gonna, you're gonna see a glimpse of the Trinity. If you pay attention, 
you're going to see the glimpse of the Trinity. This is the first time in the narrative where God changes the way he creates, the language of, of creation, the way he creates things. He changes the way he goes about creating <clears throat> humanity. Up until that point, if you read Genesis 1, God simply says, let there be. God said, let there be. Let there be light. There was light. God said, let there. But here, when he comes to creating humanity, he changes the manner in which he creates and the language that he uses. It's no longer, let there be Adam. Notice how he changes his language. Elohim said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Let us make Adam in our image and in our likeness and let them have dominion over creation. Let me explain why. Humanity, Adam, is the closest expression to God's triunity. Now, pay attention. Need you to pay attention now. There's nothing identical to God's existence in creation. There's nothing in creation that's identical to the way God exists. However, with that said, God designed humanity to come as close as possible as reflecting the fact that God is a community of persons of like essence or in fellowship with one another. Let me repeat it again. Mankind was created to be the closest creaturely, limited, finite, temporal, creaturely expression of God existing as a community of persons of same essence and fellowship with one another. Okay. Are you with me there? What do I mean? Elohim created Adam. Like Adam is not one person. Adam is male and female. Two who make up Adam. The God who created Adam is also not one person. Adam is multi-personal. Two persons at the beginning, male and female, of the same essence that have fellowship with one another. A reflection of Elohim, the Godhead, being a community of persons of same essence in fellowship with one another. That's why he changes his language and he speaks of himself in the plural and creates Adam to be plural, male and female. Did you catch it? Who didn't catch it? Everyone catch this or no? This is why in Genesis 1, God changes the manner which he creates and the language he uses to create. Elohim said, let us make Adam in our image and our likeness. Let them. So Adam is more than one person, male and female of same essence in fellowship with each other. A reflection of the God who made Adam, more than one person of same essence, because the God who made him is three persons of same essence in fellowship with one another. Is it sinking in or not? I don't know if it's sinking in. Right? So again, let me repeat what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that Adam is identical to God's existence, the way that God exists. Adam is the closest, finite, limited, temporal, creaturely expression of God's infinite being. Because don't forget, there are profound differences. You have male and female, but in the Godhead, it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There isn't a mother in the Godhead, even though the woman is created to <clears throat> express those nurturing, loving qualities of God that are exemplified in a mother. Right? So it's not identical to God. So don't go around saying, yeah, Adam. No, no, no. Adam, finite, limporal, temporal, limited, creature, physical bodies, flesh and blood, male and female, cohabit. That does not apply to God. What applies to God is, Adam is more than one person of same essence in fellowship who rules. A reflection of God being more than one person of same essence in fellowship who rules. Okay? Luis and everyone else getting it?
Everyone getting it? Exactly. Yeah, when I say getting it, you understand why it's plural now, right? Moreover, let's go to Genesis 5, verse 2 again. Genesis 5, verse 2. Here's where you're going to get blown away. Genesis 5, verse 2. Male and female, male and female too, he created he them, blessed them, and called their name Adam. How many persons called Adam? How many persons called Adam here? How many persons called Adam here? Male and female, right? So the male is Adam and the female is Adam. So wait, Eve is Adam who was married to Adam. Eve is Adam who was with Adam. Jesus is God who was with God. Oh, wow. So at the start of creation, there was Eve. Eve was with Adam and Eve was Adam. In the beginning, before creation, was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. So just like Adam can be the name of more than one person, God is the name of more than one person. So let me repeat it again. At the start of creation, there was Eve. Eve was with Adam. And Eve was Adam. In the beginning, before creation, was the Word. There was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Just like the name Adam applies to more than one person. The name God in Jehovah, Yehovah, applies to more than one person. Three persons, one God, one Jehovah. I have no idea why you're quoting DSV, because DSV doesn't translate Adam as Adam, but as man. And you're not going to make the connection. So I'll forgive you, Kevin, for that, unless you want me to stomp, stomp you. Everyone got it? The term Adam does refer to the whole human race. Yes, Cloudy. But in the beginning, it referred to the male and female, right? And if you're born of the male and female, then you share their nature. And if their nature is the nature of Adam, your nature is Adam. So the word Adam can now be applied to close to 8 billion human beings. Now, in the Godhead, there's only three persons. There's not going to be a fourth or a fifth or a sixth. Well, they got to believe that. So it's their Bible. It's in their Bible. They can't reject that. Now, they're going to reject God being a trinity, but not what I just said. All of what I said about Adam is their Hebrew scriptures, the Torah, the Tanakh, right? So how are they going to reject it? Everyone there? Everyone got it? I want it to sink in before I move on. Okay. Now we got to do an exposition of Genesis 3 to see the introduction of the corruption of the flesh. Genesis 3, the introduction of the corruption of the flesh. The introduction of the corruption of the flesh. Remember I said they were created very good, but they were created in such a way that they could choose to rebel against God. And if they rebelled against God, they would corrupt and taint themselves morally, psychologically, physically, emotionally. So are we ready for that? Are we ready for that? We're going to read Genesis 3. We're going to read 6 to 13. This is the story of Adam and Eve eating of the forbidden fruit. Genesis 3, 6 to 13. Read with me. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Now pay attention. Here's where you got to pay attention. Okay. And the eyes of them both were open. So now their eyes open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God, Jehovah God, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Jehovah God, Yehovah Elohim, amongst the trees of the garden. And Jehovah, Yehovah God, called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee? Who told you that thou was naked? 
Hast thou eaten of the tree where have I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And Jehovah God, Yahovah Elohim, said unto the woman, what is this thou that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. Here you see the irreparable damage of sin. Are you ready for me to unpack it? Here you see the irreparable damage of sin. And I've done sessions on this previously. Notice what sin did. Number one, sin corrupted their mind and their perception. It had a noetic effect. Notice that prior to eating of the tree, they were naked, but they were not ashamed. They saw each other's nakedness in a state of innocence, in a state of purity. But the moment they ate of the forbidden fruit, their minds became corrupted, so that which at one time was pure became impure. So sin damaged their perception. Sin, sin affected them psychologically. So at one time they saw things in a state of purity and innocence. Now because sin corrupted their thinking, now that which was innocent one time becomes shameful after the fact. So do you see what's known as the noetic effects of sin? Sin damages your psychological perception of the world, your mindset, the way you see reality. This is echoed in Titus 1.15, echoed in Titus 1.15. To the pure, all things are pure. Nothing is corrupt. But to the corrupt and unbelieving, right, nothing is pure. Their very minds and consciences are corrupt. Noetic. Noetic, dude. N-O-E-T-I-C. Okay. Did you catch it? What changed? Adam and Eve were naked before they ate of the tree. What changed was their mind. What changed was their perception. What changed was their psychology. Before they ate of the tree, they were naked, but there was nothing to be shamed about. They saw each other in a state of innocence and purity. But once sin entered into them, that which was innocent became corrupt, shameful, and impure. Sin damages your mind. It was never you. It damages your perception. It damages your psyche. It does irreparable psychological damage. Did you catch it? And by the way, you see the life of Adam and Eve played out in children who are born. Do you want to see the steps of Adam and Eve in our own lives? You take two children, a year old, male and female, put them in front of each other naked. What do they do? What happens? What happens? A young one-year-old boy, one young one-year-old girl, nothing. Grace, you want to get out of here? You want me to get rid of you because your mind is corrupt and filthy? Why? Because they're in a state of innocence. But take that same boy, same girl, and now they're 18 and 19 and put them together naked. What happens then? What happens then? What happens then? You get the point now? So you see the life of Adam and Eve played out in children. Like Adam and Eve, we start innocent. We see things in a state of innocence and purity. But then when the sinful nature is aroused, then things become corrupted and tainted. Okay? So that you see the first effect of sin, the noetic effect. It damages your perception how you see the world. You no longer see the world in a state of innocence and purity. You no longer see the world the way God sees it because now your minds are corrupted and tainted and you need your minds to be washed and purified. That's the new birth. The second effect of sin. Prior to Adam and Eve sinning, God would show up and they would run to God. Now, because of sin, they run away from God. Sin causes you to run from God, not run to God. Are you with me there? 
Sin causes you to run from God, not run to God. Because of your sin and shamefulness, you run away, not run to. Whereas before they sin, God would show up and they would run to God. Excited and elated that their father, their creator was there. But now because of sin, they're too embarrassed to face him and they run to hide. Is everyone clear before I move on? The second effect? The third effect of sin, the blame game. Sin pre prevents you, prohibits you from taking responsibility and incapacitates you from repenting. Because when God confronts Adam, he doesn't say, I sin. The woman you gave me made me do it. So sin handicaps you paralyzes you spiritually so that you're unable to confess, acknowledge, and repent of your sin. You try to find a scapegoat in order to alleviate yourself of responsibility of the sin you committed. You try to blame someone else. And this is all in Genesis 3. All this happened in Genesis 3. The effect of one sin, look at the damage it did. All of this in Genesis 3. Yep, Adam blamed God for the woman he gave him. So you see what sin did? Damaged their perception. Damaged their psyche. Caused them to run from God out of fear and shame. Not run to God. And prevents them from being accountable and responsible for their actions. And repenting. Causing them to find a scapegoat to point the finger to someone else and blame someone else for what they've done. Yeah, hit that like button. Everyone getting it or no? And I've thought on Genesis 3 in the past. And another thing you see that sin does, another effect. Instead of running to God, you run away from God, and then you try to undo the damage or cover up the shame by your own efforts. Notice... They sowed aprons of fig, so they trusted in their own efforts, their own works to cover their shame instead of running to God and allowing God to cover them. Thank you, Billy Mandalay. Let me repeat what he just said. Mandalay, Lord bless you, those words are from God. Is it any wonder the devil wants you to think this is a mere fable? 100%. Why do you think... The scientific community wants to destroy your faith in Genesis because it's all there. And what was the first lie of the devil? Did God really say? And that's what the scientific community wants you to start doing. Did God really create Adam and Eve? Are you with me there? Psychological damage. Your psyche is damaged. Your, your mental perception tainted, corrupted. You run from God, not run to God. Out of shame, you can't face God anymore. You try to then cover up your own shame by your own efforts instead of running to God and allowing God to cover you. And you play the blame game where you find a scapegoat, blame that person for what you did instead of taking responsibility for your actions and repenting. All of these, the effects of sin. All of these... Because the effects of sin. Yep, happy-go-lucky. Sin now corrupted them psychologically, emotionally, and physically. And because of that, any child born from them would also be tainted, would inherit that corrupted, tainted nature. Now you see why Jesus says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You see what happened? It all started from Adam and Eve. But here's the beautiful story of redemption. Billy Bob. The same reason why. Okay, forget this guy. Get this guy out of here. I'm not even stooped to this idiot's level. All right, come on. Let me focus here. Okay. Here is the story of redemption. It's not a coincidence 
that God showed up at the minute Adam and Eve sinned. You know why? When you need God the most, that's when he shows up. They were now in a state of despair and their father came running for them. Now someone will, will ask, well, why didn't he come before that to stop them? That's where choice comes in. The Lord wanted Adam and Eve to do the right thing without compulsion, but of their own choice out of their love for him. Now, let me tell you the travesty of the story. Understand the travesty. Are you ready for me to unpack it? Because we got to do a part two. Please, Father, I pray my phone is good in Jesus' name. God, it's giving up on me again. Okay, ready? All right. Notice, understand the travesty and the heartbreak to God. You're seeing it from the effects on the human humanity. Let me tell you what they did. Here is someone that shows up out of nowhere, a serpent, who gets them to question God's integrity and question God's faithfulness and goodness, even though the serpent has done nothing for them to earn their trust. He just comes out of nowhere and throws a suggestion, and that suggestion causes them to doubt the goodness of God in spite of the fact that God created a perfect world created a perfect garden, placed them in a garden with all these trees, all these fruits, and gave them perfect bodies. And to the point that God, out of his love for Adam, didn't want to see Adam alone, but created a helpmeet, and then gave them time to be alone together because he would leave them alone. Notice he would give them their own quiet time, private time. Here you go. Enjoy each other. Learn to grow with each other. I'll show up here and there and have fellowship with you. But I want you guys to get used to each other and get attached to each other. So God gave them all this. He demonstrated his love for them. He proved his love for them. And they saw the goodness of God. Adam saw it. I was alone. Next minute, you gave me a partner. So beautiful and amazing. Someone that I can walk with, talk with, have fellowship with, laugh with, eat with. You did all this for me and this perfect garden, all the animals subject to me. And because of the, the accusation, the instigation of one person, you doubted me and you turned your back against me. What would make you trust this serpent who done absolutely nothing for you? Did that serpent create you from the dust? And crown you with glory to have dominion over the physical creation? No. Did the serpent find you alone and out of compassion created a help me of the same nature to complete you? No. Did the serpent bring the animals under your control and authority to name so they're subject to you, to you to do what you wanted them to do? No. Did the serpent create a beautiful garden full of trees and fruits and vegetables to eat to your heart's desire? And gave you control over that garden? No. Did the serpent allow you to be alone with your partner so you can grow accustomed to her? So you can learn to, to love one another and become best friends and have alone time with each other? No. He didn't do any of that. But you took his word over against me in light of all I did for you? What more could I have done for you, Adam and Eve? What more did you expect from me? What else could I have added to this paradise on earth, flawless and perfect and all yours under your control? What more would you want me to do to prove my love for you? And all that I did went out the window just because of the instigation of a serpent who has done absolutely nothing for you. Nothing. What did he do to make you doubt me and trust him? What more could I have done to prove my love for you? But you did it anyway. You broke my heart. You broke my heart. What more could I have done to show you my love for you? But alas, it's over. The damage is done. 
discipline must take place. And now I will enter the world and become flesh and die in a cursed death, a shameful death. Allow the very creatures that I made to spit in my face, to cuss me and insult me, to try to stone me, throw me off a cliff, to whip me to the point of death, beat me with their hands bloody, and then drive spikes in my hands and my feet, hanging on a cross, gasping for air in front of my mother, all because of what you did. <clears throat> Adam, why? What more could I have done for you? But now it begins. Now I have to enter into this plight, the fallen condition of man, because my love for you is so great, I cannot abandon you, even though you betrayed me, even though you turned your back on me, even though you believe the word of a stranger over against your father and your friend and your brother who proved his love for you. And this is how you repay me. This is how you repay me. Right? That's the story of the fall. That's the story of the fall. Okay? You got a lot of meat tonight. You need to go back, re-listen, and re-listen re until this becomes second nature. You understand it, and then teach it to others. You have my permission to upload this to your YouTube channels. Pass out the link. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. Lord Jesus willing, we got part two tomorrow. Pray for me, my daughters, that God will keep us in love with him, keep us healthy and safe for the financial provisions to do this, and that the Lord will cause this YouTube channel to explode for his glory, right? We're going to do part two tomorrow. You got enough meat for today, right? Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is life. He is real. He is alive. He's not Make believe. He's not fairy tale. He's not fantasy. He lives in a glorified physical body that he raised and made immortal. The Bible is his word. The God of the Bible is true. He lives and he's in love with us. May we be in love with him. Lord Jesus, come sooner than later. And until you do, cover us by your blood, our loved ones, my daughters, by your blood, and seal us by your spirit to love you and never shame you to be your light and salt in this fallen world. We love you, Father, Son, and Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Lord bless you guys. More to come tomorrow. Look for me around between, between 4 and 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 4 and 5 p.m. New York time. Christ is risen and he's infinitely beautiful. What a glorious God. What a beautiful book, the Bible, his word. His voice so we can know him and trust him. Amen? We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name.